The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advise professionals, stay on top of tech trends and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can build a complete picture of your client's financial wealth. With NetWealth, you can track and monitor external bank accounts alongside residential and investment properties. Join the dots with Zeppo, a client data warehouse that connects your CRM and other tech systems with NetWealth. Discover a world of client data at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Today we're talking with Travis Carter, founder at Retrack, a Microsoft Gold partner who enables businesses to accelerate their growth through technology. Travis has recently been around the country with the FAAA Roadshow, giving an incredibly insightful and relevant session on building efficiencies for business improvement, taking people through the existing tools available within the Microsoft suite, in particular inbuilt AI tools and add-ons like Copilot, as well as newer and lesser known tools like Microsoft Syntex. We also chat about better ways to enhance your use of Microsoft Teams. I started by asking Travis what the oldest piece of tech he still owns is and whether he still uses it. I mean, interestingly enough, my tech seems to roll over pretty quickly. But right. I'd say the oldest thing I've got is an is an Onkyo receiver, like right. the, the actual audio visual device. <laughs> but from an actual IT sort of tech, I'd, I'd say there's a bunch of old Android devices and, and iPhones sitting next to my desk. But... um. I tend not to keep things like if we've moved forward, we tend to move forward. So yeah, no, no, I should sticking to the label, and I can see a printer in the background, so I'm sure that looks pretty um, flash and new. So probably under old. three years old, I guess. Gotcha. <laughs> nice. Um, I guess yeah, moving into or, or staying in this this current decade, and obviously a great person to speak to in terms of today's episode. But are there, are there one or two ways that you're using AI either personally or in your work life? I've got a couple of great examples. Obviously, mm-hmm. in work, like we're recapping meetings every day now. Every single meeting I have is recapped and AI is generating mm-hmm. notes and I'm sending follow-up emails and things like that. But that's the obvious one. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, uh, fascinating for me, last night my daughter came home from school and she was struggling with a, with a maths equation. And, um, you know, I sat down next to her and I said, I'll help you out. You know, I had no idea. Like I couldn't do it myself. And I jumped on YouTube and I was, I was trying to just understand how to do it. And I thought, no, nah, this isn't this isn't working. I wonder if like Copilot can do this, like using Microsoft's AI, the web, the free version. Um, so I, I literally went and typed in the equation she was trying to solve, and I said, "How do you do this? Like, what's what's the best way?" And bang, within seconds, I had not only the answer, which isn't the the real reason we wanted to use the Copilot, but it explained how to do it every step of the way with diagrams. With a text explanation of you know to it to achieve this to achieve this first you need to do this and then you need to do this and then you need to format it like this and then you draw it out and it got to the answer but it explained how to do it nice and anyway my daughter went to school today and did the test and and got great results like uh, and now this is not using it to do your maths for you this is le- this is instead of the teacher not being able to describe it well you've got somewhere to go to ask a question in a very direct way. That's, that's really awesome. cool. I think yeah. like that's a great example of like often we think about, you know, shortcutting our knowledge or yeah. outsourcing our brain to tools like that. But clearly if, if the results on the test um, have come back positive, then it's it's actually improved her own knowledge and yours too, obviously. It, it was the first chance that's... for her to actually understand how to do it. Yeah. And that was the difference because she didn't get enough from the teacher. So she was able to get it from an AI to Perfect. explain it. And if you, I guess when you use AI for things like that, it does explain how it got to the answer. It very rarely just spits it out like a calculator. Yeah. That's true. It does. It does. Um, 
yeah, try to give you the paragraphs and paragraphs of text of how it arrived at that answer. And that's it right. reminds me of, um, I think it was GPT 4.0, which I'm not sure if that's out yet, but there was a, an example of helping a, a father and son with trigonometry homework in a sort of audio visual sense. So that was pretty yep. cool. Um, so today, Travis, Retrack, I'm really excited for this conversation. How do you and Retrack help businesses? So basically, we started in 2008. Um, I started by myself with a laptop and uh, I, I started off just selling hours of IT support to people that needed it. And technology was evolving through that time as well. So obviously, we had people with servers in their offices and things and I got to see how they're working and I was like, I could do that better. Um, and obviously, we, we worked through helping businesses from from back then, you know, really set up their IT properly, get the security right and, you know, do the system. So, we grow pretty rapidly um, from a, a, a one-man show, just a IT support, into a managed service provider, uh, where we started doing things like you know, monitoring systems and you know, making sure everything was working working well. And um, we kind of had a freak out moment. Um, must have been about 2013, 14, when Microsoft 365 come out, and there's this cloud thing, and we've got our own hosted infrastructure, which we paid a lot of money for, and our our customers were hosted. So we're doing this hosted, managed IT environment, and uh, Microsoft 365 come out, and I got into a real panic. I thought, I don't know how we can compete with this. Like this is this is going to kill our business. So I um I got invited by Microsoft to go over to the Inspire conference um in the US in Vegas, um, which I took them up on that offer, and and we we travelled over there and really got to see where they were heading with yeah the concept of cloud and Microsoft 365. What were they trying to achieve? And the reality is they were trying to create a, uh, an environment where people could work from anywhere, where they could access technology, uh, where they could do their work, um, and they were trying to do it in a way where they, the values were right. Like it wasn't like they were, they were trying to make their partners rich or anything like that. It was really about how do we get that productivity right. And I, I took away from a you know, uh, one of the keynotes was done by Satya Nadella of, of uh, Microsoft, his fascinating man. And I listened to what he had to say and, and how he was trying to inspire the world to be as productive as possible. He, he uses a special way of describing it. And I come back to Melbourne and sat down and thought, okay, yeah, so this is going to be a thing and we're going to drive it. So I went out to try and become a partner for Microsoft 365 and uh, Telstra was the only provider of that in the country wow. at the time. And there's no CSP program, there's no program for us to join. So I... um contacted one of our vendors and said, when are we getting this? And they said, oh, it's actually coming. You'll be able to buy it soon. Telstra's off the monopoly here. <laughs> and um, we were actually the first partner um, in Australia mm-hmm. to connect and provide Microsoft 365 without Telstra. So so we got onto that very, very quickly through Ripe, or they were called Newlist at the time. So we we started to, to build this idea of a product that, that we built called Complete Cloud, which basically took... You know, what what's every business need? We need the licensing and subscriptions. Yeah, that's tick, that's easy. We need the security, like we need to be able to configure it properly. Um, and then obviously we'll want to get the benefit out of using the tools. So Microsoft three six five comes with hundreds of different, you know, productivity tools and maybe most businesses use five or ten percent of them. So we if you put those things together, we start to get, you know, what an IT solution should look like. Yeah, tick security, tick productivity. So we built this product called Complete Cloud, um, and essentially it's it's that it's a Microsoft 365 E3 or E5 license, which is the top two tier licenses Microsoft have. And the reason we went with the enterprise licensing is because it includes all the security tools without having to go out and buy something else. You don't have to go and buy a separate antivirus product. You don't have to go and buy a separate mail filtering product. We wanted to keep it in the Microsoft house as much as possible, so we built this Complete Cloud and Complete Cloud Security Bundle, which is based on the E5. Uh, and Microsoft looked at it and said, what are you doing? Like, you, you're selling this to small businesses? Like, why would you smell, sell the enterprise licenses to small businesses? And they argued that small business should have the business basic or business premium subscription. I'm like, well, so you're saying that they don't need the same security as an enterprise? Like, that was our argument. And to this day, we're still one of the highest providers of the enterprise licensing to businesses under 100 users. So we're doing that because of we need the tools to secure a small business the same as an enterprise does. And the cost difference isn't really that much, to be honest. So 
anyway, we've evolved. Um, we've been evolving that product for five or six years now. Um, every one of our clients is using it in, in some way or another. Um, and it really is that Microsoft suite plus our support and help desk. So, so we include all of our time in that. Um, and also it, it includes a backup solution to back up all the data, um, which ticks off the requirements for security and compliance. Um, it includes the configuration of all the security tools. So by default, we configure it all up. We have a great security score when you look at Microsoft um, best practice guides. And it includes uh, what we call is the umbrella, you know, covering off all the things that they need. But once once all that foundation work's done, we then go in and, and help the business to gain access to the tools. So we don't we don't charge any extra to teach them how to use things and to go and, you know, what co-pilots come out. Let's go out and mm-hmm. do a tour and show everyone how to do it. You know, syntax is there as an example. Let's go out and, and show them how to use it. So there's all these, you know, productivity tools, teams, teams calling, all these things that you can then access. And when you take away the the risk of cost each time that you want to introduce this technology, we enable it to happen. So our aim is to make sure our customers are getting the best value out of that piece. And then integrating with all the other apps that financial mm-hmm. advisors and the like are using, making sure they're set up correctly and secured. So yeah, yeah, that's pretty much how we've got to this point. Awesome. No, that's yeah. it's really insightful. And would you say that if you've got um, every client or every business on that particular type of license, that you've got you know businesses that might be using an external tool, whereas if they look inwards into the suite that they've already got, there's, there's tools that Microsoft offer that already do that and probably sometimes a bit better? I mean, when we walk into a, a new client that's started with us, there's usually a bunch of little apps that they're using. Maybe it's Trello. Um, maybe it's, um, I don't know, Zoom. Like a lot of people are yeah. using Zoom. Yeah. There's all these tools out there that they're actually paying for a subscription that includes something that's either like it or better than it. So it's it's quite, yeah, it's definitely interesting. And I think maybe uh, Microsoft's made a very clever play when they introduced Copilot because if, by doing that, you're really pointing back at those tools. So if you're using the tools inside the Microsoft, Microsoft suite and you're using Copilot, you start getting pretty capable of, of what you can do. Yeah, awesome. I guess just in our own experience, we we were running you know, Teams meetings and Zoom meetings side by side. You know, yeah. Traditionally, I think it must have just been a reactionary thing through COVID was you know Teams for internal, Zoom for clients. And then now yeah. with the, the increase in functionality of Microsoft Teams, we've been able to reduce those Zoom licenses massively. And Ooh. also on the – you're talking about sort of Trello and, and those sort of tools, like we've been able to consolidate ClickUp, which I mentioned before, which is just a basically a project management tool, plus they want to do everything else. So they just turn to this general tool. Being able to consolidate that into Microsoft Planner and then just have that yeah. inside Teams as well, like it just is a real breath of fresh air when someone can do their job or a lot of their yeah. job without leaving the tools that they use on a daily basis. Yeah, look, with respect to Zoom – like Zoom's a great video conferencing tool, right? It's the best video conferencing tool out there. There's no no doubt about it. Like in my opinion, if you want to have mm-hmm. a Zoom call, you can be guaranteed of great quality. And during the pandemic, Zoom was first first to that. Like it, they were the ones that you know definitely we wanted to start with. But you're right, the the evolution of Teams has not only equaled the video quality and the things that they're doing, but now they've brought about meeting recap and the ability to use Copilot in there and everything. It's just like it's taking it to the next level. Yeah. No, amazing. Um, I guess speaking of taking it to the next level, you've been zipping around the country at the FAAA Roadshow, which is probably imagine a little bit different to the Microsoft conference you went to back in sort of 2014 or so. Um, can you tell us about that presentation, what it really was about, sure. and, and I guess the feedback you've got as well from that, from advisors? Yeah, so I was asked by um, FAAA, to put together a business efficiencies for business improvement session. And, and what they essentially wanted us to do is to go out and, and show the advisors around Australia what new technologies are coming out, what, it, what things they can do. I call it the low-hanging fruit with AI, really. Like, what are the things coming out right now that everyone can just use tomorrow? Um, so I wanted people to leave our session knowing that they could go back to their office and turn a few things and adjust a few things and they could get massive benefit out of the, out of the tools. So, um, but I couldn't do that all alone because of uh, obviously an IT guy in a room full of full of uh, advisors. Um, I could promise too many things that maybe they're not allowed to do. 
Yeah. Uh, so, so I was partnered up with Christina Clancis from Alexis Risk, and um, it, it worked really well because if she she come from the compliance background, so she protects advisors in the event that they that they have some sort of a you know procedure against them. Um, so she she was able to look at all the things I was promising, and then then say, okay, well, actually, great guys, go ahead and use that, but here are the risks involved with it, and and, it, and in some things she said don't do that. Um, so there was. You know, some great things that I learned so much um, as well. Got, working with Christina and after by identifying the things that uh, that advisors can and can't do, and the, and the complexities around being an advisor, like it, it was amazing. Some of the things I learned and how tough it is as well, um, especially around compliance and the things that they have to do. Uh, but the, the good news is that after after the presentation, I, I got some great feedback and we were able to really. Um, I was aiming to save an hour a day of an advisor. That's really what I went went in there to do, and I think we've achieved that. We've shown them, particularly with Copilot, uh, what they can do with you know PowerPoint and email and meeting recap, those sorts of things. I think there's definitely an hour saving a day in there. Um, and then you know, we showed them Syntax as well, which is a, which is a way of constructing documents using similar to a, an old fashioned mail merge, but using online tools to do that. So. Really cool. No, I, it was. I'm, yeah, it's really cool that you've got the Christina there as well to sort of reel you back in when you get too excited. And I think yeah, it can be challenging. <laughs> she certainly did. Um, yeah, and I think, I mean, just on that, do you mind sort of taking us through maybe some of those considerations or things that we need to be not just focusing on or aware of, but also considering when it comes to this? Yeah, of course. So I'll just, um, some of the things that we were talking about was uh, the whole brave new world um, when it comes to compliance and technology, and I'll focus on the technology stuff. But um, well, we went through security and risk for financial advisors. We went through data growth, like we looked at okay, what's happening out there in the world with data right now, and you know it's exploding in size. How can we use it? And we obviously introduced the concept of using AI and productivity tools to help to um, you know overcome some of those things. So, but uh, I think like any time you talk about technology and you talk about productivity and you know AI, you can't have that conversation without first talking about security and making sure that we've got yeah you know, the compliance things in check. So um, some of the some of the points around that 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 we definitely covered off on was about making sure our systems are secure, our data is in the right spot, and we've connected our applications properly. Uh, because failing to get that umbrella over our system means you know, data breach is a is a is a reasonable possibility. So I, I actually referred to the concept that I started with of the server in the corner in the office. Now it's not unusual for financial advisors to have that set up back five, eight, ten years ago. Where you'd have a server sitting there, you'd have a USB drive connected to it, and all of your data and applications is running in there, and you just go about your day. And we had this safe security environment. Um, but what's happened now, uh, well, happened quite a while ago, financial advisors were one of the first industries to jump to the cloud. Um, so they they rapidly took up things like, uh, you know, G Suite online or took up you know, Microsoft 365. They started using apps that are hosted um, externally for their line of business applications. And they, they went crazy. Like there's so many apps everywhere. And I'd say out of all the industries, advisors were probably the fastest to that. Um, so that that was great, but now with the cyber risks that's coming about at all, it's really created this you know uh, almost unsafe environment to operate, where our data is you know across platforms. We've got Dropbox holding files over here, and Microsoft holding files over there. And we've got applications hosted in three six five, and then we've got applications. They're all disconnected. We've got passwords for all different things. It's almost unmanageable. Um, so it's now the time to start bringing that together. And that's really what our complete cloud is about, is trying to help bring that together. Uh, we raised the point of uh, the essential eight and we asked the question of the room, hey, you guys familiar with the essential eight? Yeah, what this is? And we'd always get a few hands go up. Um, but look, the essential eight is the Australian Cybersecurity Centre's, you know, um, recommended maturity models for business in Australia as, as by Defence Australia, you know, with level three being the defence level. Um, and level zero being the, you know, I guess the the home business with no security requirements, um, selling, you know, apples in the in the market or whatever. So then, 
we talk a lot about yeah the maturity model at level one and how that is a great starting point for businesses to adopt. So you can uh, go straight out to the um, ACSC website and have a look at recommendations as policies, procedures, and everything. We, we like to make sure that uh, everyone's got the opportunity to do that. And if their IT company can support them with that, great. Um, if not, they need to seek some help and and try and get to that level one point. Uh, we also talked about cyber insurance and, and the fact that a lot of uh, businesses haven't really considered it yet and haven't really considered the problem. Um, but the reality is that even if we adopt Essential 8 and do everything right, we can only really, there's still going to be risk and it's still going to be around at least 10% chance that you could have a, a cyber breach after you've rolled out the essential aid and, and done everything right. So uh, we talked about as well that cyber insurance isn't that expensive in the scheme of things um, because we know that the average data breach for a small business in Australia costs around $45,000. So the cyber insurance for a small business in Australia is sort of around the 1500 to 2000 mark. wasn't too bad. Um, and it's not a, not a bad way. And then we also just like wanted to reinforce that if we're going to use Copilot, if we're going to use AI tools to, you know, help with productivity, well, then there's also a fair bit of risk around making sure the security in our environment's right. And one of the great examples we talk about is that, you know, if you've got a spreadsheet in your business with payroll data um, and it's sitting in your OneDrive or sitting in your SharePoint folder as an example, and you haven't realized, but maybe you've shared that folder out to someone well, once you start using AI tools, um, maybe the human being is not capable and fast enough to figure out what somebody's getting paid. But if you if you had a spreadsheet with payroll data and you said, oh, what's Patrick get paid? Um, it will go and find that spreadsheet and, and read out your salary. <laughs> like it's, it's that sort of easy with AI. So if you haven't got that system ready, well, then it needs to be made ready before you start adding AI to, to your employees and your organization. So, yeah, um, but yeah, the data breaches, like we, we talked about the fact that it was 94,000 cases last year, 23% yeah. up on the year before, and that's a case oh, every yeah. six minutes, so it's, it's not going away. Um, and yeah, obviously, data itself, like if we talk about the internet right now, um, we've got this great sign, I'm happy to send it out to anyone who wants to see it, yeah. um, but it talks about the amount of data that's getting processed in the world every day. And uh, Domo's website, domo.com, I think it is, you can go out there and, and check it out. But one of the things they put on their graphic is like Taylor Swift, every minute of the day, there's 69,500 songs streaming of hers. Like that's unbelievable. And, and the fact that there's so much data in the world, so much data getting generated, now what, is, what are we supposed to do with it? That's probably the big point is, you know, in our organizations, we're really only analyzing 30, 35 to 40 percent of our data. We're not using it. And out on the internet, um, there's a whole other bunch of data out there that, that we're not really um, accessing. My favorite stat out of that slide, by the way, is the fact that every minute of the day, every person generates 102 megs of data. Like, that's insane, right? 102 megs yeah. of data every minute of the day, every person oh generates. Like, that's what the world's growing by in, in, data science so you all it yeah and, and i i think i i like to talk about the fact that it's not us doing that like we are generating the photo and we're saving it to you know yeah. google photos or, or whatever but then google's adding metadata to that they're adding search capabilities to it so every time they do that there's more and more data generated so everything just multiplies real so yeah, yeah. but yeah with all that data how we're we supposed to use it and and i think the answer is is ai ai is the way we can get access to the information to make it somewhat useful. Um, Gartner came out with a prediction um, that by 2026, 80% of enterprises will be using generative AI or AI-enabled APIs. Um, uh, that's only 18 months away now. Yeah. So 80% of businesses will be using it, which is up from 5% when the report was run at the start of this year. So, yeah. like, massive growth in the technology being adopted, and we're seeing that in our client base as well. Um, nearly all of our clients have, have deployed Copilot in some fashion, um, and Copilot really is just that um, that starting point, right? It's just that low-hanging fruit. It can do the basic features for us. Um, down the track, what's that look like? Like, down the track, it's going to go way past yeah. just asking it to help us type an email. 
it's going to be able to analyze our portfolio and help us make you know good good decisions about which way we should go with a particular product or service yeah. or or whatever. I mean, have you got um, it, uh, just that stat about eighty percent? It does feel like that basically all of us are using it at least in some way or have had a crack. Um, yeah, yeah. Have you have you got like any th- insights or thoughts on? Based on your current yeah. sort of client base, how are they using, in particular, Copilot on a daily basis in their in a financial planning context? Maybe uh, I think the most obvious one for use right now is meeting recap. Uh, I'd say that's that's the one thing right now that that everyone that is using it is definitely using it for. So you jump into a Teams meeting, you record and transcribe the meeting. I obviously get permission to do that. Otherwise, Christina would tell me off. <laughs> Um, but you record and transcribe a meeting, and then at the end of the meeting, you can go into the appointment and click on recap, and it gives you this great summary. You know, it gives you the video obviously with the recording and the ability to see who spoke when. Like it gives a graphic for that. But then the other thing that's really cool um, is it gives you AI notes, so the ability just to see who said what or, or what were the commitments made. More importantly, it filters out the the less important things and focuses on what was talked about, what was decided on, um, and it creates a list of tasks that are required to be completed after the meeting. So I've had yeah, three meetings um, today where that was used, and each one of them I've actually taken the, the recap and I've sent it out to everyone, and I'm getting yeah. in the habit of doing that to show them how good it is. Like It's just yeah. insane that at the end of it, you can have a task list of what everybody committed to. And that, that's not even Copilot. Like that's Teams Premium generating that. Okay. So, yep. so Teams Premium is 10 bucks a month per person. It's, it's quite inexpensive to use. Mm-hmm. Um, Copilot is about $55 a month, but it does mean that then you can ask questions of the meeting. Like yeah, that's the difference. That's between- what I was going to ask you is is what are the key differences in, in that? I think you've just alluded to it there. But so what you're saying is at, the, at a bare minimum for just the low, low price of 10 bucks per user yep. per month, we can essentially ditch the um, the manual notes and the file note That's headache right. afterwards yep. and get that summary. But then what you're saying is if we upgrade that to the actual paid co-pilot license, you can then yep. query that conversation. Yeah, so you can go back to a meeting that you've still got on file or it's been recorded. You can go back to a meeting six or eight weeks ago and say, you know, what were the, what were the tasks that needed to be done at that meeting? because of I've forgotten or whatever, and it'll yep. list them for you. You can say, what questions weren't answered that I need to follow up with? Or you can say, create an FAQ about this, like a, a frequently asked questions about this meeting. You can create anything, write a document about it if you like. Um, Copilot will be able to do that, providing there's a transcript and a recording of the meeting. Uh, it's able to go back and do that. Um, and then that's that's really the key difference for Teams Premium, mm-hmm. which... Honestly, like the Teams Premium meeting recap is is um for for the ten dollars is unreal. Like it is something that everyone will use. Um, and it's for file notes. It's just so simple to grab that, paste it into your file note. The important thing though is to remember that when we've used AI to create the notes, and, and Teams Premium uses AI to do that. Um, before you save them, you still have to read through and just check. You know, is this my recollection of how it happened? Because if if you just start letting AI keep the file notes, particularly in the financial advice world, you might end up you know, running into a little bit of trouble um, with you know, not actually capturing it correctly. Um, so I, I always say co- um, Copilot and Teams Premium with AI have both got the ability to, to generate the notes to about 95%, right? So that 5% is still required to go through and just make sure that you're happy with it before you save it as an actual file note. So yeah. Yeah. No, amazing. And you're still getting that massive efficiency and productivity boost there. And I'm just sort of picking up on that great example of FAQs where, you know, if you took a sample size of maybe all of your clients or the businesses' clients that you've met with over the past month, you could bring through what are the top three or five questions clients are asking and, you know, turn that into a you know client newsletter or something like that. Like you can then take that across into maybe a marketing lens or yep. support lens in terms of website stuff. Have you got any sort of comments yeah. on that? Oh, well, even if you've got things like documents from your products, you know, products that you yeah. use in financial advice, they're providing you certain things um, in PDFs or Word or whatever they are, 
you can take them and say, well, I want to I want to make our own version of that. So I want to FAQ about this product that's relevant to our business and, and I want to create a PowerPoint about this product. So I, I might have like a product disclosure statement or something and I want to create a PowerPoint out of that. You can do that in minutes without even needing to format. You know, you can go into PowerPoint, go new, click on Copilot, point, point to the source and say, create me a PowerPoint on this and it'll do it. And like in our demonstration, we use that. We had a, an advice document, a sample advice document mm-hmm. um, that we that we created with Syntax, and we took that document and turned it into a PowerPoint in like three minutes. And it was unreal. I like to watch people's face drop. Like, are you serious? Like that could take four to five hours to make manually, and now we're doing this in three minutes. Yeah, that's so incredible. It's, it's incredible. That's unheard of. I'm just thinking too. Like you, we've got all of these sort of financial product platform providers that we use and they all have their own way of generating reports right. and portfolio returns and all that sort of thing. Um, with the exception of the sponsor of this podcast um, with, you know, beautiful reports and dashboarding, being able to see of course. returns and, and all that sort of information without having yeah. to think twice, you could easily put that in there and start to question that document. What was the return for this period? What asset performed poorly or whatever the question is. It, it's That's just right. really, really cool. Yeah, I mean, we put RG175 into our SharePoint okay. environment and started asking questions about it. Uh, we even asked questions like in in Word, like, is this advice document compliant with RG175? And it was crazy because they come out and said, you know, um, and sometimes we have different answers, I should point out. But but when we did that, it was like, yes, it's compliant because it needs to meet these, uh, these certain requirements. And it did because you said this, this, and this. But it always said... And Christina always made a point of this. It always said you should get your own independent legal advice or, or compliance yeah. advice when you're looking at these things. But it was just really interesting to give two sets of data. One is your, your advice document and one is the, the RG guidance. What can it do? You know, and, and, and ultimately, I wouldn't trust it, um, but it does – Give yeah, you some pointers. Good it progress. does give you, you some pointers. So. Yeah. No, it's yeah. great. And I think too, like that really takes the – the, the burden off like compliance spot checks and, and being able to review more files in a, in a much more efficient way from a compliance perspective. That's yeah. really and cool. And I think it's no. also important to note that the agencies that monitor this industry and financial advice, they have these tools. Yeah. So so when you get audited, they're going to be able to look at things in a lot more detail than they were able to two years ago. Cool. So that's kind of another example. No, it's a good point. It, sort of the, the playing field is, is leveled. Um, that's right. That is really that's really insightful and really exciting. Um, I think if we talk about like document automation, I, I, yeah. I mentioned before we hit record that syntax is actually not something I'd heard of before I sort of organised this um, session with you. Do you mind sort of taking us through that in a bit more detail because it sounds pretty cool? It's really interesting, and I I chose to include it in our FAA session because I just thought it's such a an easy piece of of. Uh, you know, automation that's sitting there that no one's really talking about and using, but but Microsoft's investing heavily in it. So I, I started with Syntex at, about three or four months ago, just playing, like, can we create a document? Can we do a mail merge? And that's all I could really do at the time. And I, I log in now and there's like 10 or 15 different elements of it, like unprocessed document scanning, OCR. So oh, yeah. we used to have to have a scanner sitting there, right, to do OCR and then convert something into a document. No, now you can just receive an email with a document. It'll read it and then take the data that's relevant out of that and place it in a database for you. So things like receipt scanning and and um, invoice pay, um, purchase orders, all those sorts of things that, that we use out in industries can be automated without the use of the scanner and those sorts of things now. Uh, and... Um, the one that we we played with um, with the F- FAA's presentation was to grab an advice document, a sample document, and have a database of you know, clients. And on the on the fun side of that, I use ChatGPT to generate a Python script to go and create this list of fake clients with their health status and their incomes and all the things financial advisors might keep um, as a record. Um, so basically, we did that. We've got this list now of of a hundred different fake clients with probably yeah, one hundred and fifty different fields about them, um, and we're able to go into a modern template generated by Syntax and SharePoint. Just go new document, select the household that we're doing, or select the the client that we're looking after, 
and hit generate, and it generates this document with all of the fields out of that database in seconds. Um, and then you can basically, as an advisor, you can open that up and go through it and then populate all the specific advice that you might want to put in there or edit it. But yeah, but it takes the groundwork. And I was, I was just talking to an advisor this morning about it and, that, and I was asking him how they did it. Um, and they do it manually. So basically they go and grab a, an old document and they they clear it out and they start again. Like, and it must take hours to do that. But if we can at least fill, you know, sixty percent of the file in that case, and then go and do the advice part, well, then that's something they can do. Um, but syntax can do lots of other stuff too. Very cool sort of features there. Yeah, cool. No, that's I, that's I, compelling. I should point out though, um, to set syntax up, any Microsoft three six five tenant can set it up. Um, there is you have to connect it to an Azure subscription, which is only for the purpose as, as it's built based on processing. How many documents you scan or process is, is how much you pay for it. And I think for for a 10-page document, it's a couple of cents. Like it's not expensive to use. So so it's really like a pay-as-you-go model, which might pay actually suit more businesses in terms of its scales yeah. with you. I think so too. Cool. That's that's amazing. So just, just to confirm my understanding, did you say that you were able to with the syntax capabilities, extract all the data from a document, say like a statement of advice, and put that into essentially a data table? Or was it the other way no, around? So, so it's kind of the other way around. You've got okay. the data table with all the information you've collected about your clients yep. and you're creating a document from that. Wow. So, so, and as I said, you, unless you've got something to actually enter the advice into the table somewhere, um, generally speaking, you're going to create a Word document with yeah, all the facts in there, but now you've got to go and add all the advisor parts to it. So that's an example of, of how it could be used. Yep. But in the un, unstructured document scanning and with the structured document scanning, you can take a telephone bill, right, as an example. You can scan it, scan five of them, and then grab all of the things you that you want to collect out of the telephone bill, maybe like, yeah, the, the invoice number and the build to and, and how much the invoice was and what mobile numbers. So you can select them. And if you select them on five different documents to train the model, then nice. the next one it scans, it'll know what data you need and where to save it. So it's really like compelling and, and can get quite advanced. Um, mm-hmm. But the reality is, is the opportunity to free up time is is there, no question about it. That's really cool. And I think if we're thinking about – new clients or existing clients where you're doing fact finding and they're sending you statements or right. that sort of thing if you're getting the same um, looking statement or invoice or maybe particularly in, in accounting where they've got source documents coming through either every quarter every month or every financial yep. year pretty easily easy to train a model there to say put this here um, extract and, and data counter these, and yeah, place amazing. it somewhere that's right oh wow so that's incredible Trevor so we've covered um, Copilot and Syntex which are both very exciting um, parts of the Microsoft suite. Are there any other tools in the suite that you feel are worth mentioning from maybe a productivity or efficiency perspective? Uh, I think mo- like a lot of advisors are already using Teams. Um, I think enhancing Teams is probably one of the things that, that's worth talking about. So, so when you talk of, when you think about Teams, there's obviously the meeting and calendar function in there where most people have, have got to know Teams. Um, but definitely the the chat part as well. And a lot of businesses are using it for chat. But we've replaced in our organization all emails with with either chat or collaboration in the channels. Um, but probably the other the, the main thing about Teams that most people miss is the fact that you can actually store all of your files and structure in there. And when you do that, you create a collaboration space where you can collaborate with your team members without having to send bundles of emails and files and attachments, you're really referring back to a file that's already there. What most people don't realize, and this is something we do, uh, I, I believe we do this quite well, is we show them that that's actually SharePoint in the background. Mm-hmm. So so whilst you've got Teams at the front, you don't have to use Teams to go and access your files. You can use a OneDrive app, you can sync it to your desktop if you're on, or you can use you know, SharePoint in a customized GUI. So I guess people um, probably don't realize that there's lots of capabilities in there. Um, but the other thing a lot of people don't realize, I should mention, is there's Teams calling now. So you yeah. can attach phone lines to that and get rid of your old phone system. And then if you're using Copilot and Meeting Recap, those features become available to you just for phone calls, which is what we're doing in our hub desk now. It's it's quite cool. Um, but the other bit of tech that I think is worth mentioning is Teams Rooms. 
So, so where you've got a conference room set up, and a lot of the advisors I was talking to as we are traveling around have a conference room, and they want to be able to record meetings in their conference room. Um, Teams room enables that with an intelligent speaker. You can actually have you know, 10 people in the room all talking, and we can recap what they're saying as who they are because oh, cool. of using the Teams room infrastructure. So there's lots of cool things that are there. I love Teams, so I'll talk about that for hours. Um but yeah, um, apart from that, there's just the productivity apps in, in Microsoft 365 too that come for free. Like there's things like Viva. There's Viva Goals, which is like a goal setting tool. Okay. There's Viva Engage, which is like an engagement tool to keep to keep you. If you've got a larger team, those two things work work really, really well. Um, and you've also got obviously tools like Platter and To Do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all, all these all these things that are really simple to use. And, and when people use them, they're, they're generally pretty happy with them. No, that's that's awesome insight. Yeah, just it's so simple. But Microsoft to do like I just I'm able to set up what I need to do for today, so I actually feel like I've made right. progress and I've progress. Bit of um, Pavlov's uh, dog there with the the ding that it makes when you complete a task. Like, how, feel like you're making oh, progress. Gonna, how, how great is that? You you click a button, and ding. Yes, yeah. and then I just have this. I just get immediately disappointed when the audio is down on my device and it doesn't ring, and I need to turn it back up and untick you it and stick it. it again. Exactly. Um, and just on the team stuff, like that's like we definitely have that issue in terms of in our business. We've got multiple meeting rooms, um, but you end up having that meeting room that's essentially a user, and they're doing all the talking. But really, it, as you're saying, it's that intelligent view there where you actually have the people um, contributing to the meeting, not the room itself, which means you can. I assume if using Copilot, better query that meeting or better actually that's right. capture meeting minutes at a bare minimum. Yeah. So when you when you um, have a meeting in a team room without an intelligent speaker, obviously it's just the room that's yep. that's recapping it. Room said this, room said that. Once you've added the intelligent speaker to it um, with the appropriate license and the team room infrastructure, uh, then it'll say speaker one, speaker two, speaker three, speaker four, and you can type over who's nice. who, and you, you get that nice. Um, experience where you can then recap properly and take minutes properly very cool so travis to to round out the discussion there's obviously a lot of areas that we can focus on and the risk of sort of shiny object syndrome albeit within the microsoft suite do you have one tip just one tip you'd give to advise businesses on where to start or where to begin i think i always like to have a champion in the office like someone in the office that is tasked with making sure this stuff's done right. Um, so we always, uh, with our clients, we always say, who is your champion? We identify them through our training process and we say, who is that person um, who can lead it in your organization? I think that's probably the, the biggest thing because of without an internal passionate person trying to sort of evolve the technology, you're not going to get very far. Um, no matter who you engage or who you use. Now, for really small teams, we're happy to play that role. Um, but for larger teams, you really need that person um, in there doing it. Yep. Uh, on a on a co-pilot perspective, I think there is an assessment that, that really should be done before you roll it out to your whole company. So getting a trusted partner to do that, um, and, and there's plenty of managed service providers that are experienced in that. Uh, we're certainly happy to help with that. Um, but then even on Microsoft's website, there's a readiness assessment you can do, which basically asks the questions about, you know, is your business ready just to roll it out? Um, and I know with the the one benefit about our umbrella scenario with with our complete cloud is that our clients are already ready because of the way we do that. Um, but if they haven't got that sort of thing set up, well, then they their readiness assessment on the Microsoft.com website is a really good one to sort of go through and ask the questions that you need to ask. And it talks about things like, you know, what file security structures do you have in place? It's just a question and answer thing. Uh, but when it's completed, you, you get a readiness score that basically says, how ready are you um, um, for Copilot? So I filled it out for our business and it said, you're yeah. 100% ready. So I was happy with oh, that, nice. um, which is good because everyone's using it. But um, I love it. But yeah. Perfect. Great tips. So when we did the presentation for FAAA, we did four specific um, demonstrations. So we had syntax. We did email with Copilot. Uh, we did creating a PowerPoint from a document in Copilot. And we also did the meeting recap. Um, so I've actually got some videos that I've made from that. So if anybody actually wants a copy of those, uh, we'll include a link um, on the on the advice. And uh, then if anybody clicks on the link, uh, you can give us a few details and we'll send those to you um, so you can have a look at how it actually works. 
And I think for like to anybody that that wants to connect with me, I'm open. Uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn, uh, Travis Carter. You can find me just by searching. I'm happy to take connections and have have people reach out to me and ask me questions. I enjoy education just as much as I enjoy rolling it out as a, as a business. Um, and apart from that, uh, we've got our, our website, retract.com.au. Um, you can come on there and that's retract with a C, not a K at the end. Yeah. Um, you can come on there and, and, and register your interest. We're happy to talk to anyone um, and take you through the process of how to set it up properly. Beautiful. And we'll be sure to include all relevant links in the show notes. Travis, thank you so much for your time. Anytime. Thank you.